There are levels to this and overseas basketball is no different. What's up guys, it's Jose Colorado from josecolorado.com and the re-education of overseas basketball. Now, a question I've been getting a lot lately is how good do you have to be to play overseas basketball? And unfortunately, there is no quantifiable answer I can give you on this. This is, it's just impossible to answer because this is gonna depend on a multitude of factors, your skill level, where you came from, what league you're in, what country you're in, who are your teammates, do they play with you? But although the on-court differences will vary considerably, regardless of where you play in, there's going to be a lot of similar shared experiences when it comes to barriers of actually playing overseas basketball and in terms of how hard it is to actually perform your best. So I'm going to run down quickly the seven biggest factors that you need to know when you're playing overseas basketball for how hard it is. Let's get into it right now. Now, the first thing you have to consider is the practice. Players are expected to come and play with no practice at all, without knowing the plays, without practicing with all of their teammates, with maybe the first time not even getting individual practice and they just come in and they're playing. And this is something that is really expected on a lot of levels across the world in overseas basketball. And quite frankly, it comes to a shock to a lot of players. You would assume that traditionally in the North American system, you're going to have a training camp. You're at least going to have some familiarity with your teammates before you actually get on the court with them. But it is completely different in overseas basketball. It is urgent. You're in there and you're out. So they don't have time to waste as they're waiting for you to get acclimated with your teammates, as they're waiting for you to get settled into the culture. You're there and you're playing as soon as you can. And sometimes that may be the same day as you fly in. Sometimes that may be the day before. Sometimes that may be an hour or two before the game even happens. No matter what, the main takeaway is don't wait on practice time. Don't wait to know the place. If you don't know the place and you're screwing up up there that's no excuse they they're not going to care so you better go out there and kill no matter what and that actually goes into the second thing that you have to be aware of and that is that the leash is so short in overseas basketball i actually wrote a blog post on this uh way back i'll link in the description below but essentially i would say on average it's three strikes and you're out for many leagues meaning you have three games if you don't play well in those three games you're out that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's what I've seen on average. I've seen players play one game and be out, two games and be out. I've seen, heck, I've seen the last season I was actually in, we had a player who flew in. We had a, a two-week training camp. We didn't even hit our first regular season game, and they cut him. They said, we hadn't seen enough. He wasn't playing well enough in practice. You got to go out there and kill, however that looks. If that's you getting on the glass, if that's what you're known as, then go and do it. If that's you getting a ton of buckets, then you better be aggressive. And just because you do your job, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that you won't get cut. I've seen guys average 28 and eight and get cut. I've seen guys average 30 points and get cut as rookies and it's just devastating to them because they just realize their dream and before they know it, it's over. And then there's no guarantee again that they'll get another contract because other teams may look at them like, well, you played two games there, what's up with that? So that's something that you gotta know. This leash is short, go out there and kill. Now the third thing that you have to be on the lookout for is the playing environments themselves. Now I'm specifically right now talking about the courts. If you're playing in Latin America, African countries, even some European countries and some Middle Eastern countries, these courts will shock you, they'll appall you, you won't know what hit you. Cause you'll be playing on cement, concrete, tile, courts on a slant, courts sloping down, rims that are bent up, rims that are bent down, all types of environments that you would not believe are associated with overseas basketball, but they are. And at the end of the day, they're not going to change. So you better be ready for it and you better make the most of it. And you got a hoop on it. It doesn't matter what the playing condition is. A lot of guys go there and they're really, really shocked on it. And all of a sudden they can't shoot out there. So this is something that you really got to be conscious of beforehand. And for me, I always tell players, you know, go play on a difficult rim, go play on a difficult court. That rim that you play at your local university or your local high school and that nice uh, nicely kept floor that you don't slip on you know it may not be realistic to where you'll actually start in overseas basketball so you got to build that mental toughness from the start and say no matter what rim I'm on no matter where I'm playing it doesn't matter to me because I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I do out there the fourth thing is the refereeing 
and the officiating. It is just awful. There is no getting around it. And the one thing you really, really got to be on the lookout for is that the refs always favor the locals. They will always favor the local players because they built relationships with them. They've seen them grow up through the farm system, through the grassroots system, and they know who they are. And a lot of them, quite frankly, are friends and buddy buddy off the off the court as well. So you gotta be prepared for it and you gotta play through any contact and build that in your mind right now that the referee will be terrible. They won't favor you. And even worse is for the most part in these countries, you won't be able to speak the language. So even if you want to have a civil conversation with the referee, they they can understand it and they may even interpret it as being hostile or aggressive towards them and they'll be quick on the whistle to give you a T. Culturally, maybe in the States or in Canada or Australia, wherever you are, you may speak to referees in a certain tone, in a certain manner, and you get away with it. Interpreted in another culture, in another language, in another environment, they may view that as something else and tee you up and have a vendetta against you. The fifth thing that you need to be on the lookout for is that there really is no recovery or recuperation methods in a lot of these countries. They simply can't afford it. Though so a lot of them don't have money to invest in medical staff and recovery recovery and all of these things that you may have if you are a division one player division two player you are going to be used to this it's going to be like you don't even think about it but over there you're pretty much on your own there may be some things that they will provide to you but for the most part you're going to be on your own so for me this is something that I really took seriously as I got older and I started investing in more things like foam rollers, thermo guns, ice bath. But this is something that you have to be aware of. And if you go there and you're expecting them to have all of this equipment, all of this uh, recovery methods, all of these recuperation things, they're not going to have it. So you better come there equipped. The sixth thing that I would really look out for is the fans. Now, this can get really crazy, hostile, sometimes even dangerous, quite honestly. They're going to heckle, they're going to ridicule you, whatever they're going to do to try and get you off your game. But here in a lot of these countries, it can sometimes go over the top. It can get into uh, homophobic slurs, racist slurs are really common. It's unfortunate, but this is something that a lot of people, you just have to learn to play through. There's not going to be much protection, quite honestly, from the police or the staff and or the organizations in a lot of these countries because sometimes they're just used to this type of environment, this type of culture of whatever these fans can say. And sometimes it'll boil over the edge. You know, I've seen people... Uh, throw stuff on the court, beer cans, coin, lighters, water bottles. Fans rush the court and break the barrier or the barricade. I saw a grandma once come on the court to protect her son and hit the guy with a purse in his face. You just got to learn through. And if you've been noticing, a bunch of these things are really mental. A lot of these things are mental toughness, learning to play through them, learning to block it out and just focusing in on your game and what you have to do and your own fans sometimes won't be nice either they may boo you out the court they might say that they're not coming they're not attending the games anymore if you're not performing the board of directors are going to have to make a decision because if a loyal fan base or a loyal part of the fan base aren't attending the games anymore because they're dissatisfied with the player selections then ultimately that's money that they're losing and they may have to cut you in the end so the fans have a lot of say the fans have a lot of control in some of these countries and last but not least the most obvious one would be the language this is going to be a big barrier for a lot of players depending obviously on what languages you can speak and where you're from and what country you go to but for the vast majority this is going to be a big barrier because the coaches often will speak in that language a lot of the teammates will probably speak in that language as you will likely have maybe two or three who will speak some form of English, depending on how good it is. Some of it can be really broken. Then you may get lucky. You may strike lucky and have a fluent teammate on your club. But this is going to be a big transition for a lot of people because you just won't know about 70 or 80 percent of what is being said 90 percent likely won't know of what is being said. So that's why I always encourage players wherever you're going, if you know you got a contract, in some country that speaks Spanish, I would honestly get on Duolingo or something like that and just learn a bit about Spanish and really dive into the culture, really dive in to the language when you're there. 
you know, don't seclude yourself. Career suicide when they do this, when they seclude themselves by themselves and they don't engage with the culture and the environment because then they're really isolating themselves people are less inclined to help you. And if that's the case, you already have all these other factors I explained to you that which are going against you. So you don't need that as well coming from your teammates or your coach because they think that you're standoffish, like you don't wanna learn the language, you don't wanna invest in the team like that. So there you have it, seven things that may shock you for how hard overseas basketball is. Now I'm gonna be providing more content like this in the future. So if you like it, go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe. Also, I recently came up with some basketball resume templates, which I'm hoping will really help players who are looking to get their start in overseas basketball. They're cheap, they're affordable, they're high quality. I'll leave the links below if you're interested in that. Otherwise, thanks so much for tuning in. Take care, God bless, and peace, guys.